So hello Internet and welcome to Spacey Chile. Our guest today is Fotini Vervelido. Fotini is a postdoctoral researcher at uh, MIT. Hi Misha. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit more? Uh, of course. As you said, I am a postdoc uh, at the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences at MIT. The general question I'm interested in is what magnetic fields uh, of planets can teach us about how planets form and evolve in time. So uh, let's start with a very simple question. What is a magnetic field? Right. Uh, very simple, but indeed uh, not that obvious. The basic physical explanation of what a magnetic field is would be that it's a force. And of course we can't see it, but we sense its presence by the force that it applies on a moving charged particle. So a moving charged particle in the presence of a magnetic field will have its motion altered because of that force. And another general property is that we have magnetic fields wherever we have electrical currents. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what's fascinating about the planetary magnetic fields is that planets generate and host so large scale electrical currents that the magnetic fields that emerge uh, are actually of a planetary scale. So do all planets in our solar system have magnetic fields? Uh, almost, yes, with the only exception of Venus, okay. uh, which for now we have not detected. All other planets uh, do have a magnetic field, yes. So how about you take us to, uh, on a tour, a magnetic tour of the solar system? Sure, that sounds cool. So, we can do uh, that. What planet do you want to start with? Uh, I would say to, uh, let's start by Earth, since it's our, our planet and it's also the planet whose magnetic field we know best. It was back in the uh, 1600s that the English scientist uh, William uh, Gilbert uh, said the famous Earth behaves like a, a giant magnet. And indeed, uh, he, he was right in the sense that Earth does behave like it has at its very center a bar magnet. And that's why we have a North and a South Pole and that's why the compass uh, works on Earth. Uh, of course, there is no magnet at the, at the center of the Earth, what actually is molten iron. To be more specific, the core of the Earth has two different layers, the inner core and the outer core. The inner core is solid, so it does not contribute to the magnetic field of the Earth. The outer core is in liquid form, so it's an alloy of iron and nickel, and it moves. It moves because uh, the Earth rotates and also because of temperature differences between the, the bottom and the top layer. And this is what uh, generates the magnetic field. So this process is known as the planetary dynamo. Charged particles that are constantly emanated by the sun push the magnetic field of, uh, of the Earth. That's why it's closer to the Earth at the day side, while at the night side they can extend much further. So the, if it wasn't for the magnetic field, these uh, charged particles would penetrate Earth's atmosphere and it would actually stripe it away and wouldn't have any atmosphere and by consequence there wouldn't be life uh, on Earth. However, there is a place they do uh, manage to penetrate and that's at the uh, North and South Pole. And that's why we have this very beautiful majestical phenomena we call the polar lights or yeah. the aurora. So what happens there is, due to the geometry of the, of the magnetic field of the Earth, it's easier for these particles to penetrate the atmosphere. And when they do penetrate, they excite the molecules of the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and then these, they emit light at uh, different colors, and that's what generates these magnificent colors that we can observe during auroras. Is there any chance that this magnetic field will disappear with time? Not in our lifetime, for sure. Okay. So. It will eventually disappear when the entire core of the Earth becomes solid, but that will probably take billions of years, so we don't have to worry. But there is actually a case in our solar system where the planet had a magnetic field like that of the Earth that at some point much earlier in its history it sat down, and that uh, is the case of Mars. So the general way we study magnetic fields of other planets is by sending uh, spacecrafts. So we send spacecrafts that have uh, magnetometers on board. They orbit the planets, they take measurements. So in the case of Mars, uh, it was the Mars Global Surveyor by, by NASA that first showed very clearly that Mars has a very strongly magnetized crust, uh, but uh, only a magnetized crust, not, not a global magnetic field like that of the Earth. Let me explain a bit how rocks uh, acquire magnetic 
orientation. So um, for this, we have to go from a planetary scale. Now we have to string and uh, go and look at microscopic scales, what's going on. So the electrons, due to their motion, uh, their spin, they act as a tiny magnetic dipoles. Um, and so when in a rock you have lots of these uh, electrons pointing at the same direction, then you say that the, this rock is magnetized. There are various rocks with various properties, and the ones that have the high content in the so-called ferromagnetic minerals, these are the ones that can acquire a strong magnetization in the presence of a magnetic field. What's very interesting about it is that they can actually retain this magnetization over billions of years. Even if the magnetic field that uh, gave rise to this uh, magnetization is no longer present. So we have magnetometers where we can mount centimeter scale samples of these rocks and then we can measure their uh, magnetic field and also their magnetic properties. So how well they can record the magnetic field and how well they can preserve this, uh, this record. And also by measuring the magnetic field that they have now, we can make calculations and infer how strong was the magnetic field that magnetized them in the first place. And by doing that, we can understand whether the body they come from had a magnetic dynamo and how strong uh, that was. Similarly to Mars, the Earth's moon only has crustal fields. So mm -hmm. there is currently no global field surrounding, but its rocks are magnetized. And we know that from, from spacecraft measurements, but also from uh, rocks that we brought back to Earth during the Apollo mission. So astronauts brought back to Earth almost 400 of, uh, kilograms of lunar rocks. And these are stored in a NASA facility, the Johnson Space Center. And they are distributed uh, around laboratories and research centers in the world. It has been found that lunar rocks are magnetized. And the Moon actually had a magnetic field similar to that of the Earth uh, around 4 to 3.5 billion years ago. Uh, and then this magnetic field started declining. They have difficulties explaining why a lunar dynamo would be so strong, given mm -hmm. the very small size of right. the lunar core. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's definitely an open question. Uh, and uh, we, are, uh, we have good hopes for progress being done on this front because of new missions. So the Chinese mission Changi 5 just very recently brought back to Earth a new material from the Moon. And also there is the Artemis program, which is a program organized by NASA and uh, in collaboration with space agencies from other countries that has as an objective to prepare a crewed mission for Moon. And this time there will be also women landing uh, on the moon. Will you be one of them? Uh, <laughs> no, I won't, but uh, I, I've, uh, I, we actually have common friends that might be. So, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the other planets now? Sure. So, so we start. Let's start with uh, Mercury, since it's the closest to the Sun, and then we take it from there. So, Mercury has a magnetic field similar to the Earth in the sense that it has a global magnetic field and a crustal magnetic. So, it has a magnetic field that's generated at its core and uh, this magnetic field has magnetized its crust. Uh, it is much weaker than that of the Earth, it's just 1% uh, of the strength of the Earth. And one peculiar thing with the magnetic field of Mercury is that uh, while on Earth we can simulate what's, uh, what's around the Earth by the field that would be generated by a dipole at its center, this dipole, uh, this dipole in the case of Mercury is actually uh, displaced uh, towards the north, so it does not sit at uh, the center. There is a baby Colombo which got launched in 2018 and it should arrive on Mercury in 2025 and it has a magnetometer on board and will definitely increase our uh, understanding of what goes on with this planet. The next one is Venus, so you already told us that Venus doesn't have a right. dynamo. Right. Venus doesn't have an internally generated field. So 
we have not even detected a crustal magnetic field on Venus. So this makes it the only planet in our solar system with no magnetic field at all. But there are some people that believe that it might have crustal fields, but that are of smaller spatial scales. So because of the altitude of the spacecraft uh, that have been sent up to now, they have not been detected. So it might be that if we manage to send a mission that can take measurements much closer to the inner surface, we might see something that we are not seeing right now. The next one is Earth. I think we already talked about Right, we talked about Earth and the Moon. So next uh, is Mars. Mm -hmm. So Mars has this very strongly magnetized crust. It's 10 times more magnetized than the crust of the Earth. Oh, wow. But it's not magnetized everywhere. It's very strongly magnetized at its southern hemisphere, but it's very weakly magnetized over its northern hemisphere. And we don't really know why. One scenario that is possible concerning what has happened to Mars is that Mars used to have a dynamo and that's how its rocks got magnetized. The question of uh, when the Martian dynamo stopped is very interesting because it can clarify whether there is a link between magnetic field and presence of liquid water. As I said earlier, the magnetic field of Earth protects uh, its atmosphere for, from being striped away by the solar wind. So one of the theories concerning Mars is that Mars had this dynamo field that stopped at some point, and when it stopped, then its atmosphere got striped away uh, by the solar wind. And when uh, the planet loses uh, its atmosphere, then the liquid water evaporates. So we have some morphological evidence that suggests that Mars had water uh, on its surface Phase and now it doesn't and so of course it's a big question what happened to Mars. Last year uh, NASA landed a new rover on Mars. Right. Perseverance. So the mission is the Mars 2020 mission which landed uh, the Perseverance rover uh, on Mars in February 2021 and the landing site of this rover has been very carefully chosen precisely in order to allow us to tackle these questions. So where did the Perseverance rover land? It landed uh, on the Jezero crater and Jezero crater is believed to have been an ancient uh, lake. The topography of this crater looks like an, an ancient delta of a river that used to uh, flow into that lake. And um, one other important aspect of that uh, landing site is that within a small region, we have rocks that go from 4 billion years ago up to 2 billion years ago. So we cover a 2 billion years span of Mars uh, geological history in, in such a short distance. Yeah. The Perseverance rover will drill four cores, uh, will store them very carefully in tubes and it will uh, leave them on the surface of Mars for subsequent missions to go and uh, pick them up and bring them to Earth. So the subsequent phase is still in its preparation phase and it's gonna be actually a collaboration between NASA and the European Space Agency. Estimated time of arrival for these rocks on Earth is about in about 10 years. Do, do we already have Martian rocks on Earth? Actually, we do. The rocks that we have uh, from Mars are from meteorites, so just rocks that fall on Earth, mm -hmm. and then we find some of them over deserts and over Antarctica, where they are easier to be identified. So when they fall on Antarctica, we are lucky because there there is a scientific base, and so there are scientists that know how to identify them and they collect them properly and store them so that they can be used for scientific studies. Mm -hmm. However, when they fall on uh, deserts, they're very often they are being uh, picked up by nomads who use very often magnets to identify them and uh, scan large areas in the desert. And while this is okay for many types of studies. When you want to study this rock for, from a magnetic field mm. perspective, uh, you can't because uh, just touching a magnet on that rock erases its entire magnetic record. We should please magnets don't stack on <laughs> Absolutely, please. That's the second video we're talking about. This, right? <laughs> it's really important. Please don't do it. It's such a pity. 
Okay, so let's move to the big planets now. So we're crossing the asteroid belt and we're reaching Jupiter. So does Jupiter has a magnetic field? It absolutely has. It has a gigantic uh, magnetic field actually. And uh, Jupiter right now has a spacecraft that's orbiting around Juno and NASA mission. Jupiter has a very strong uh, dynamo field. It's 10 times stronger than that of uh, the Earth. And even more impressive is the fact that it extends to a huge distance around the planet. So it extends up to 5 million kilometers, which is 100 times the planet's radius and almost 10 times the radius of the Sun. Uh, and it's generated in the core of Jupiter, which is is made mainly of metallic hydrogen and this is also the case for uh, Saturn. So Saturn has also a dynamo field again generated at its core. The strength of the magnetic field is, is a bit weaker than that of the Earth. And since the magnetic field of Jupiter is so strong, the moons of Jupiter are kind of swimming in that magnetic mm -hmm. field. And I can mention one example, it's the example of Europa, for which there is currently a mission under development, the Europa Clipper. So why Europa is so interesting? Because the cell of the planet is an icy crust, but it is believed that below this icy crust there is an ocean. And so ocean means salty water, and so salty water in movement, in motion, uh, in the presence of a magnetic field, Jupiter's magnetic field in this case, generates a magnetic field. So one of the objectives of the Europa Clipper mission is to study in the magnetic field of Europa in order to infer the properties of this ocean layer. And now, of course, the reason we are so interested in that is that uh, water in our solar system might be a potential habitable environment. So maybe we'll have fishes in the oceans. Yes, maybe, and Europe. big whales. Uh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so let's move to the icy giants, Uranus and Neptune. Right. For this, unfortunately, we don't know that much because they've only been studied back in the 70s. And what we learned about them is that they also have global dynamo generated fields. And there is uh, something very interesting also in, uh, in this case. It's the fact that the um, axis of the magnetic field is uh, very highly tilted with respect to the axis of the planet. So both of them, they have a very big tilt and we don't know why. So that's one of the mysteries again. Thanks for taking for this uh, magnetic tour of the solar Yeah, system. thank you very much. That was a lot of fun. Thank you.